We're going to begin in Romans chapter 13, uh, the first three verses. You may be very familiar with them, and uh, there's, again, controversy on how these are interpreted, but we're just going to read them, and I might give commentary, might not. But uh, Romans chapter 13, 1 through 3 says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God, and the powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then uh, not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. Now I'm also going to run to a couple other verses. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul says uh, to his protege, Timothy, a young pastor, he says in verse uh, chapter 2, uh, verse 1 says, I exhort therefore that... First of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And then 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 17 the Apostle Peter says, Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Now we know when he wrote this, uh, the, there was under the uh, domain of the Roman Empire, and what he was really referring to when, when it says here, honor the king, he's talking about Caesar, the Caesars that were there. Honor Caesar. Um, now in, in Jude, and I think this is another perspective, of, of those in authority and how to look at them, or let's say not how to look at them. In Jude chapter 1, verse 8, there's only one chapter, but or it's one book, but uh, verse 8, it says, Likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with, with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses durst not bring against him a rallying accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. But these speak evil of those that are <clears throat> those things which they know not. But what they know naturally as brute beasts, in those things they corrupt themselves. Now, this is interesting text right here because uh, he's saying here that there are certain people that uh, uh, despise dominions, that's people who are in authority. And it also says in verse 9 that here uh, an example of what we should follow is uh, even Michael, the archangel. I mean, you can't get any higher in the uh, angelic realm uh, and close to God. And here Michael, the archangel, in disputing with Satan. Now, you can't get any worse than Satan, anyone, <laughs> no, any person, any government, than Satan himself, the prince and power of the air, the enemy of your soul and mine and God's enemy, and he, uh, I should say, uh, Michael, this archangel, would not bring, it says, a railing accusation. In other words, he didn't uh, 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 insult Satan. He didn't uh, uh, make uh, uh, attacks uh, verbally on Satan. He simply said, the Lord rebuke thee, knowing that there's a higher power than the devil, and that's God himself. And he, could, he, he calls upon the Lord to rebuke Satan. And the Bible even says in the Christian life, that's the way we're supposed to deal with, with Satan ourselves. It says, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. But the way it's done is submit yourselves to God. Uh, and and uh, that's how we combat Satan. And definitely there is satanic activity all around. Uh, we say demonic, but the Bible calls it uh, devil's that are uh, <clears throat> influencing the lives and the minds of the lost, and even influencing uh, some that are saved too. You know that Peter was influenced by Satan when he, uh, the Lord had to rebuke Peter, and he said, get thee hence Satan. And it wasn't, Peter wasn't Satan, but the thing is, Satan, Peter was being influenced by Satan. Uh, so uh, we're, we look at these scriptures, and it talks about dealing with authorities in a very respectful, honorable way way because we know that all authority is ordained of the Lord. Could be bad authority, could be good authority, but God let them be in place, uh, which um, is very hard to swallow. 
<clears throat> but the thing is, mankind has always, because we are created in the image of God, and because we have this uh, sense of justice, and again, because we have, we're all created with this image of what is, something is right, something's wrong, something we say would be fair or just, where do we get that from? We don't get that from the animal kingdom. We don't get that from our own intellect. It's something that God has instilled in us and universally. And the thing is, this is our, we call it our conscience. But the thing is, this is the, uh, the knowledge that God has given us of what's righteous, what's right. And it either convicts us that we're wrong or something is wrong, or it uh, rewards us to say, this is right. And we feel good about uh, when good things are happening in that it's uh, con in conjunction with our, our conscience. But uh, when we see governments getting out of control, when we see injustice taking place, when we see that freedom and liberty is being uh, uh, thwarted and even there's oppression, uh, we don't like that. See, because we were created, as you look in the Garden of Eden, we were created to, as Jesus said to, uh, God said to uh, Adam and Eve in the Garden, he said, you may eat freely of everything in the Garden of Eden. Now, there was a restriction. There was a restriction on one, one tree. But think of it. God gave them freedom. There was liberty. That's the initial, that was the initial uh, calling and initial uh, setup. For, for man. And so we always, uh, we, we thrive. We enjoy, as not only enjoy, but we really thrive as a human being in all our potentials when we have liberty and freedom. Freedom to think, freedom to speak, freedom to assemble, freedom to travel. Uh, all these liberties, we would call them. And why do we, uh, why are they restricted? They're restricted because we live in a fallen world. We live in a fallen world. And, we, and if we, all we have to do, uh, I should say, to understand today, we have to understand yesterday. If you don't know where you came from, then you'll really understand, understand where you are and where you're going. So it's always important to know a little history. The more you know history, the better, better you know where you're going and what direction you're going. Um, um, and as well, um, the Bible, because the Bible gives you the right context of interpreting the past and even, again, uh, present and future. We're going to go into sh sh uh, looking at a few protests as there's protests going on in Ottawa today. Uh, this is a big day of protests. There's, there's, there has been pr protests are part of humanity protesting against author uh, to authoritarian power over their life. In Hong Kong, not too long ago, 19, uh, 2019, in March, the government of Hong Kong proposed a bill that would have allowed extraditions to mainland China. That meant anybody who had uh, uh, a, uh, a, an offense against the state, instead of it being tried in Hong Kong, it had to be in Beijing. It had to be in a federal, because Hong Kong was separate, uh, and had actually different laws than the mainland. And so this new law came in, and in response, the people of Hong Kong took to the streets in record-breaking numbers, and on June 16th, up to 2 million people marched peacefully uh, <clears throat> in the streets of Hong Kong. Hong Kong police have responded to the protests with batons, tear gas, pepper spray, rubber bullets, and water cannons. Although the extradition bill had now been dropped, the movement had evolved into a much wider call for change and protests in Hong Kong. <clears throat> and Hong Kong uh, was a British colony in 1997, and when sovereignty of the territory was turned back to China uh, under the deal struck between the UK and China, uh, Hong Kong was guaranteed a separate legal and economic system. The deal also guaranteed the continued protection of a range of human rights in Hong Kong. The principle of one country, two systems was, the was enshrined in Hong Kong's basic law. So <clears throat> um, this was the way it was set up and uh, it was supposed to, uh, you know, as it was turned over in, in 1997, 
This was supposed to be a different kind of China in Hong Kong. But um, in 2017, President Xi Jinping warned that any attempt in Hong Kong to endanger China's national sovereignty and security, quote unquote, or challenge the power of the central government, crossed a red line and should be dealt with harshly. And Beijing considers pro-democracy protests in Hong Kong to be a threat in China's national security. So, consequently, what took place, people were arrested, and the protests have stopped. I'm sure people have uh, died as well. Um, <clears throat> there's a protest that went on very uh, uh, nation, uh, worldwide. Understand, uh, w- the world was looking at this not too long ago, and uh, it's gone. In Tiananmen Square, again in China, protests where student um, in the Tiananmen Square, the famous, uh, uh, what do they call it, the gate to the Forbidden City, uh, <clears throat> uh, Heaven's Gate or whatever they call it, uh, it was called the student, it was a student-led demonstration calling for democracy, free speech, and free press in China. Uh, th- they were uh, halted in a bloody crackdown known as the Tiananmen Square Massacre by the Chinese government in June 4th and 5th in 1989. Pro-democracy protests, mostly students, initially marched through Beijing and Tiananmen Square following the death of of Hu uh, Yao Bang, who, a former Communist Party leader, <clears throat> had worked to introduce democratic reforms in China. In mourning Hu, the students called for more open democratic, a more open democratic government. Eventually, thousands of people joined the students in Tiananmen Square, and the protest numbers increased in numbers to the tens of thousands by mid-May. And although China's government had instituted a number of reforms in 1980 uh, that established a limited form of capitalism in the country, the poor and working class Chinese still faced significant challenges, including lack of jobs and increased poverty. And the students argued that the China's uh, educational system did not adequately pre- prepare them for the economic uh, system with the free market capitalism. Some uh, leaders from China's government were sympathetic to the protesters, uh, and while others saw it as a political threat. And then in May 13th of uh, 1989, <clears throat> a number of student protesters initiated a hunger struck, hunger strike, which inspired um, other similar strikes throughout all of China. And the movement grew, and the Chinese government became increasingly uncomfortable with the protests. And the Chinese government... Uh, declared martial law on May 20th, and uh, 250,000 troops entered Beijing. In the the end of May, more than one million protesters had gathered in Tiananmen Square. They held daily marches and vigils, and images of the events were transmitted uh, by media organizations uh, to audiences in uh, U.S. and Europe. Uh, And then Uh, While the uh, initial presence of the military failed to stop the protests, the Chinese authorities decided to increase their aggression. And at 1 a.m. on June 4th, Chinese soldiers and police stormed Tiananmen Square, firing live rounds into the crowd. Although thousands of protesters simply tried to escape, others fought back, uh, stoning the attacking troops and setting fire to military vehicles, reporters, and Western diplomats there that day estimated that that hundreds of thousands of protesters were killed in Tiananmen Square massacre, and and 10,000 were arrested. Now, there's another protest that ended in a bloody mess. Then there's the American Revolution. In the beginning of the American Revolution, the northern North American colonies were very proud to be British. But when the French and Indian War took place, which was 1754 to 1763, King George III lost a great deal of money due to uh, buying expenses, supplies for his army, and the colonies. In order to pay off his debt, he imposed taxes on the colonies without their consent, and the colonists immediately began a boycott of British goods. King George wasted no time in sending troops across the Atlantic to make sure the colonies were behaving as they should. 
And what soon happened was, uh, most famous was the American Revolution came to pass. Uh, what happened was a uh, was what they call the Boston Tea Party. Uh, a British uh, uh, ship owner uh, had a, uh, a ship laden with tea uh, and um, uh, f from Great Britain, and he was going to unload it. And it was supposed to be taxed by the uh, by the it was taxed to the colonists, and so a group of colonists dressed as American Indians boarded the ship at night, <clears throat> threw the tea overboard into the harbor, ruining all of it. And this incensed King George. And uh, so in, in response to that, the king imposed what's called the Intoler Intolerable Acts. And two of those were points in that Intolerable Acts was the Boston Port Act, which um, closing the port of Boston until the Dutch East Indian Company had re been repaid for the destroyed tea and also Quartering Act, which ordered the colonies to provide lodging for British soldiers. And the Quartering Act incensed the colonies most, and the King and Parliament revived an old law requiring colonists to house British soldiers in their home, and the colonies declared themselves independent from Great Britain, and the war was on. And there became a, the American Revolution <clears throat> from Great Britain. Again, a protest to uh, <clears throat> injustices in the taxes and uh, abuses of, uh, of private, uh, private property and private uh, domain uh, resulted <clears throat> in a war. And yes, the American Revolution was successful to the Americans. But then there's the French Revolution. The French Revolution, also termed the Revolution of 1789, um, which denoted the end of the... Uh, like I say it in French, the ancien, ancient regime <laughs> um, in France. And the French Revolution had great causes common to all revolutions of the West at the end of the 18th century, and particular cause that explained why it was the most violent and the most universally significant of the revolutions. The first and the general cause of the social structures of the West, the feudal regime had been weakened step by step and had already disappeared in parts of Europe. Now, the feudal system was you had your king or queen, uh, and then you had your noblemen, and then you had your serfs, and then you had your peasants. Uh, and it was always this class system. Uh, and you basically, wherever you were in life, wherever you were born in life, that's where you remained. Uh, but this was slowly uh, breaking down, this feudal system. And it says the increasing numbers of prosperous elites of the wealthy commoners, merchants, mer uh, manufacturers, and professionals, often called the bourgeoisie, these are people who had money and had businesses, owned land, aspired to political power in those countries where it did not already possess it. The peasants, many of whom owned land, uh, had attained an improved standard of living and education and wanted to get rid of the last vestiges of the feudalism as to acquire the full rights of land ownership uh, and to be free to increase their wealth and holdings. Then there was the, uh, the philosophers, or they call philosophies, uh, these intellectuals whose writings inspired reform and social arguments, and they and were certainly influenced by 17th century theorists like uh, René Descartes, Benedict uh, de, uh, de Spinoza, and John Locke. These were men, actually, who were philosophers, and uh, and they would, uh, and, and a lot of their um, their reasonings were uh, were employed in a lot of what we have today in our democratic governments. Uh, but uh, they always came to different conclusions politically, socially, economically, and the revolution of the French seemed necessary to apply the ideas of Montesquieu, Vol Voltaire, or Jean. Jacques Rousseau. Uh, this enlightenment, quote-unquote, was spread among the educated classes by the many and the societies of thought that were founded at the time, Masonic lodges, agricultural societies, and reading rooms. And so the reason for the French Revolution are a few points. The bourgeoisie, again, very rich people, resented the exclusion from political power and positions of honor. Uh, the peasants were uh, very aware 
of their situation and were less and less willing to support the old regime of the feudal system. And the philosophers uh, and the, the, the uh, intelligentsia academic world had been reading uh, uh, more widely, had been read more widely in France than anywhere else. All these ideas were more spread in France than anywhere else in Europe. And Fra French participation in the American Revolution, as they tried to help the Americans defeat Great Britain, had driven the government to the brink of bankruptcy. And the French monarchy no longer was seen as divinely ordained. Uh, it was looked at as just uh, there were the social pressures put upon it. And therefore, uh, the divine right of kings, like Louis the Sixteenth, uh, was uh, was disregarded. And so, consequently, what took place in the French Revolution was what they called the Reign of Terror, uh, and it was just uh, a mob rule. And forty thousand people died by the guillotine. Uh, Louis the Sixteenth was beheaded, as well as uh, his wife Marie Antoinette. And lo and behold, Napoleon. Uh, came to power in 1799 as the emperor dictator of France. A little history here. Not, not done. Not done. We're almost done. Not done. The Russian Revolution. The Russian Revolution <clears throat> back in 1917 uh, was, uh, you could say, successful uh, in, in bringing in communism uh, and overthrowing the Tsar, Nicholas, and... Um, I can't remember her name, but um, the the, uh, the Romanovs, the family, uh, and they they weren't the best rulers, that's for sure. Made a lot of blunders. Well, anyway, they were overthrown by the by the uh, the Communist Party uh, of Trotsky and Lenin, um, who came in, and and then later uh, Joseph Stalin uh, became the uh, the head of the party, and uh, over. I read, I think, 50 to 60 million people died as a result of Joseph Stalin's rule uh, coming to power after the revolution. Uh, but the revolutions are always promised to be, um, you know, revolutions, protests are always promised to, we're going to have liberty, we're going to have freedom. But what they actually got was worse. Uh, there was a famous book that came out called Animal Farm. Uh, written by George Orwell, the same author that wrote uh, 1984, which is a, uh, a book to be read today more than probably any other book to understand what's taking place. But anyway, Orwell wrote this book and about the animal farm, and it was really about the Russian Revolution. And he says that in the book um, that, uh, it, that the book uh, served not so much to condemn the tyranny or despotism as to indict the horrifying hypocrisy of tyrannies that base themselves on and owe their initial power to ideologies of liberation and equality. Now, let me just unpack that a little bit. He's saying that these protests and these overthrows of the government and where the evil comes in is usually under the guise of liberty and freedom. That's how they get in. They promise liberty and freedom, and what they bring is more oppression. Now, we're, what we're talking about is history. We have to remember this. If we want to know where we are and know where we're going, listen, one thing they say man never learns from history or man learns from history is that man never learns from history. And so we must understand that uh, it's something very um, delicate. And the Christian way to handle this any protest, and let's say even any revolution, is not just overthrow the government. Now, the Canadian vaccine mandate and the Freedom Convoy, what's taking place today, 50,000 truckers protesting the COVID-19 vaccine mandates. Now, they're not really against vaccine. As a matter of fact, they say 90, uh, Justin Trudeau said 90% of them uh, have been vaccinated. <clears throat> so what's the problem? Well, they just don't like the mandate. They don't like that when you when those who aren't vaccinated 
cross the border to the U.S. to because think about it, Canada is always importing. We you know we can't uh, uh, grow a lot of our crops here, and especially in the cold weather, we have to always import. I like to have bananas. We don't grow bananas here, uh, even oranges, um, and even rarely sometimes even apples. But the thing is, uh, we're always importing, and so you got truckers going back and forth across the border. And if they're not vaccinated, they've got a quarantine for 14 days. Now, you might say, well, that's reasonable. Okay, that's what you say is reasonable. They think it's very oppressive because that's part of their livelihood. Okay, so this is what the protest is about, but it's grown to more. Now, our, our prime minister has said the small fringe minority of people who are on their way to Ottawa who are holding unacceptable views that they are expressing do not represent the views of Canadians. Uh, he, he said on a, a televised speech, and he argued that uh, uh, Canadians disagree with the protesters. And he says, quote, that following the science and stepping up to protect each other is the best way to continue to ensure our freedoms, our rights, our values as a country. Now, when you talk about liberty, and he even mentioned to ensure our freedoms and our rights, uh, when you're when you're when you're saying freedoms and rights, what does that mean? Obviously, there are some people that feel like they don't have some freedom. Obviously, there is uh, uh, some liberties that are being deprived of people. Say, yeah, I know, but the majority said we need to have this uh, uh, this mandate. The majority thinks that way. Well. I guess you can say that you can say that and believe anything you want. But the thing is, is that really the liberty and the freedom of a true? Uh, I mean, you could say that's democratic, of course. Democratic simply means if you have 50 percent or 51 percent of the people and not even 51 percent, just uh, one person over 50 percent will make it the majority over the rest of the people. Just 50% plus one person will rule over the rest. That's what, a dem I mean, that's what democracy means. The majority will rule. But truthfully, the Western democracy has not been set up that way. It's been set up to have a representative government. We have representatives. We, have, we call them, whether it's a prime minister or a member of parliament, we have certain individuals we elect to represent us. And the and the 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 uh, the groundwork of the moral of the country is that we protect the rights of the minority, huh? The majority in control uh, can be a tyranny on the minority. So therefore, we look at the minority. This is where our government has been set up to look at the minority and say we need to protect the little guy, protect the small group, protect the people who are not in the same uh, 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 agreement or don't believe the same as the majority. Canadian writes, the last living politician, the last living today politician who helped draft the Canadian Constitution's Charter of Rights and Freedoms has launched a lawsuit against our prime minister, uh, and the federal government for violating the charter's provisions. Now, he was the, the one of the original drafters of the Canadian Charters and Rights and Freedoms. Uh, the Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms totally filed a lawsuit uh, in federal court uh, seeking to strike down the federal government's mandatory COVID-19 vaccine requirements for air travelers. Um, this was in the press release. The main applicant in the case is former uh, Newfoundland Premier, the Honorable A. Brian Peckford, the only surviving drafter and signatory 40 years after the 1982 Constitution uh, the, and, and, and the Charter of Rights and Freedoms was enacted. <clears throat> the lawsuit uh, uh, specif uh, specifically targets uh, uh, Prime Minister uh, Justin Trudeau's October 30th uh, uh, 2021 policy, uh, which states that anyone over the age of 12 traveling by air, train, or ship must be, quote, fully vaccinated. So uh, uh, this has been uh, 
uh, this is being contested uh, in our courts and our and one of the drafters of the Charter of Rights, one of the original drafters, says that we're getting it wrong according to the way uh, it was truly drafted. And one of the lines that's very interesting, I heard his interview, and one of the lines that the uh, this honorable uh, uh, Brian Peckford uh, said was, in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, the first, very, very first line he says, whereas, it says, whereas Canada is founded upon the principles that recognize the supremacy of God and the rule of law. The supremacy of God and the rule of law. Our Canadian rights and freedoms have been founded, at least uh, stated, to be founded upon the rule, the, 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 God is supreme. The supremacy of God. God is the supreme authority. And at the same time, the rule of law, not the rule of the mob, the rule of law. And the rule of law comes from what we have uh, all agreed to by our representatives. Now, we're talking about freedom. We're talking about liberty. Now, if we're talking about even God, and he's the supreme one to give us liberty and freedom, what does that look like? Because everybody has a different idea. Of free- you want freedom to go to the store. You want freedom to, um, you know, uh, uh, have your choose your own doctor. All these things, freedoms and liberties you want. But the thing is, um, uh, that might, and even if you don't uh, agree with mandates or vaccines, whatever, um, do we have the liberty and freedom to do that? Again, we're, we may say, well, for the greater good. Well, like I said, what kind of a country are you living in? We're living in a country that to protects the minority because we know that the majority can be over, uh, um, overbearing. We're not living under the kings and queens. We're not living under emperors. At least that's the way our government was set up. And any, listen, uh, the, in the Bible, any government uh, can work. Any government can work. I mean, you see, mostly it's kings or emperors in the Bible. And, and God's word can thrive. So it's not the system per se. It's the people, the way they accept God's rule. And when we accept God's rule, no matter what the system, we can live in peace. We can live in prosperity. We can live in uh, liberty and freedom. Here's some points What does freedom look like? Well, the nature of freedom is personal, private, and individual. If you're talking about freedom, it's about the individual. We're not talking about a group of people. We're not talking about the society. We're not talking about, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the country at large. We're talking about the individual is free. If the individual is not free, then nobody's free. And so, uh, and, and the thing is about Christianity, we get that principle from Christianity. Jesus uh, says, all that the Father giveth to me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Jesus looked to the individual, and he says, him that cometh to me. He didn't say, all the group that comes to me. He said, the individual. See, Christianity looks at the individual. It looks at the personal application of trusting. It doesn't look at the group think. Freedom is uh, also not only private and uh, personal, it's unique. Each individual is free to be different, to be himself, to be unique. Uh, If one is free simply to be like others or to conform to the predetermined pattern, that's not freedom. If we're all supposed to follow and be like everyone else, now, of course, we have things common, but we have a lot of things different. And see, uh, freedom means you can be that different. You can have that difference. In Christ, there's an acknowledgement of the individual's characteristic in the body of Christ that all are of equal importance, even though we're different. This is how Christianity produces in a land great liberty and freedom if we adopt the principles of the scripture. 
In Romans chapter 12, verse one, uh, verse 4 and 6, it says, For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. And then verse 6, Having then gifts differing according to the grace given unto us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. In other words, we all have different abilities and gifts, and we're all one, even though we're different. So we can be united. Freedom is unique. Freedom is also a must by its nature available to all equally. In other words, yes, it goes to the individual, but it can't say, okay, just these individuals. No, it goes to all individuals. There can be no true freedom without this, without uh, um, where there is inequality. And there's no freedom where there's no special favors or barriers or restrictions to public access. This is not freedom. And in Christ, again, our model as a Christian, we go to the Bible, in Christ, we all have access and acceptance. Colossians 3.11 says, where <clears throat> there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free, but Christ is all and in all. Now, let me just say this, stop for a minute. You don't find this in all the other religions. You find this in Christianity. And uh, in and, and, and our major religions, I don't care if it's Judaism, uh, you find divisions of the people. In Christianity, you don't see that. Which, may, which brings me to the, the thought that our Western society that we enjoy and we talk about having liberty and freedom and democracy and representative government. Where did, they, where did that type of thinking come from? Well, actually, it was birthed under the Roman Empire. But it wasn't the Caesars that came up with it. It was the Christians who were being persecuted. That's what they believe. They believe the scriptures. We can, we can, uh, we can uh, um, grant... The, uh, the, our liberties and the peace that we enjoy today to the truths of the Bible if we're living in the Western world. Now, other parts of the world, I, I don't, they can't say that. But now, as many, many today have adopted those same principles. Uh, also, freedom is the most demanding of civil societies. In other words, if you have liberty and freedom, it's very demanding on you personally. You say, why? I got freedom. I don't have to worry about a thing. Oh, no, no, no. You got to worry about a lot. Freedom is the most demanding form of civil governments. Freedom demands and depends upon the self-discipline from both the governed and the governing. In other words, self-discipline must be employed on the subject, let's call them subjects, uh, or the citizenry, and those in government power. Self-discipline. Now, the old, in the old days, the king or the emperor could just say, I want this to happen, and boom, it's, it's law. And if you don't follow his way, um, could be off with your head. But not the way in a, in, a, in a free society. In a free society, there must be restraints of yourself and restraints as well on those who are governing. The foundation of freedom is self-government. And the foundation of self-government self-control. Let me say it again. The foundation of freedom is self-government. And the foundation of self-government is self-control. And this, again, we get from the scriptures. You have to have a higher uh, uh, um, authority in your life rather than just yourself or just your buddies or just society. And that's God, the supremacy of God in your life. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 34, Jesus answered, said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. See, you can be a servant to sin, and if you're committing sin, you're bound to it. You need to be liberated from the sin. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, it says, uh, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Wow. Take up your cross. The cross was an instrument of death. The cross was an instrument of you die 
and you follow Jesus. And see, in a free society, you say, I don't do everything I want to do. I do what I'm supposed to do by, by God's rule, by God's moral law. Now, we have, got, have such a perverted view of liberty and freedom today, which actually is a lie. When people are given, are said that, oh, you can go sin and you can go do all these things, anything your heart desires, and we, you, because you have liberty and freedom, they're lying to you. That's not liberty and freedom, that's slavery. And as a matter of fact, it's destructive in your life and to everyone who's around you. See, having liberty and freedom is having self control. And that's the basis, that's the, the groundwork, that's the foundation of a self-government and a free society. In Romans chapter 6, verse 16, it says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are in whom ye obey, whether of sin or to death, or obedience unto righteousness. See, you have a choice to make. You have a choice to make. In, Rome, in Romans 6, verse 18 now, being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. And then skipping to verse 20, for when ye were servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. In other words, you can't have it both ways. Either you're a slave to sin or you're a servant to righteousness. And that's what the free society, or I should say the free society, uh, the, uh, the, the, the self-government and uh, uh, freedom uh, and, liber and, and society of liberty is based upon. That's where it comes from. And when, this is, when the common man is corrupted to think that he can do anything he wants and anything his little heart desires, his, let me say this, his little wicked heart desires, he's destroying, he's been deceived, and he's destroying the liberty and the peace that, he's trying, that, he, that he thinks he's enjoying, that he, or I should say that he does enjoy, and eventually, it'll, it'll result in tyranny, oppression down the road. This is history. This is history. See, the morality of the people, the morality of the people is the most important thing. I don't care what system of government. I don't care what, who's in power. If you have a moral people that are following the word of God, they're the ones who are really in power in a free society. You know, they're the ones who are really in power. Freedom in Christ is a self-disciplined life. We've talked a lot about that just a, just a moment ago. But not a forced obedience. It's by, it's by choice. Uh, Matthew chapter 22, uh, 37 says, that Jesus said to them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy mind, uh, uh, and thy soul, and with all thy mind. He says, and this is the first of a great commandment, and the second is like it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The Bible says that we're supposed to love God supremely, and we're supposed to love our neighbor. Now, you don't get that in communism. <laughs> you don't even necessarily get that in socialism. To love no, 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 you guys will all have equal share of everything. Doesn't mean I have to love you. No, you know what the Bible says? No, you have to love your neighbor. As a matter of fact, in the, in the Jewish custom, it was if you saw your neighbor's ox fall into a ditch, you were required to go lift that ox out of the ditch and, and, uh, and restore it back to the owner. If you saw it, if you're a witness of that, and if you didn't, shame on you, and there could be some... Uh, 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 violation uh, on you for not doing so. And Jesus used that many times as an example of how we need to take care of people, even over animals. More so. Loving people, loving your neighbor. See, and, and this, is the, this is the, again, these are the ground rules of the free society. This is the ground rules of freedom. This is the ground rules of liberty. Not, I can do anything I want to do, and I want everybody off my back. That's a libertarian viewpoint. Now, there are some good things about libertarians, but the libertarian viewpoint to the extreme is tyranny. It will not result in freedom and liberty. 
it'll res- it'll result in more change in your lo- in your life. Why? I just know what history says. That's all. I just know what history says. And those who govern themselves need very little government. If you govern yourself, you don't need the government to be on your back. And the Bible said, if you don't have to fear the government, you don't have to fear those who are in power, if you're doing right, <laughs> you can be an atheist, truthfully, and at the same time believe in freedom. But a society of active, militant atheists will not bring a free society. Well, how can you say that? We, we, have, we believe in justice and freedom. And, well, I just look at history. I look at Adolf Hitler, fascism. I look at Joseph Stalin with communism. These guys were true atheists. And they, they, they put that, in, they put that in, in law. And now we have socialism, which is saying basically the same thing. As a matter of fact, like I, I just quoted with the Char- Charter of Rights and Freedoms, the first line says, we recognize the supremacy of God. And at the same time, we say we're a secular culture, a secular society. We have no God. That's hypocrisy. It's hypocrisy that you have no God. Of course you have to recognize there's a God. Now, which God? Uh, we're not going to say which God. Any God will any God do. That's confusion. That's confusion. It used to be in this land in Canada, you'd say, it's the God of the Bible. The Judeo-Christian God. But they don't say that anymore. It's too offensive. Too offensive? Well, don't you know that the civil, that the, the, the self-government that we enjoy, the foundation, has come from the Bible? I mean, people don't believe history. As a matter of fact, that's the problem. They look at history and say, oh, that was then. It's got nothing to do with us today. And that is just self-delusion. The more you have, or I should say, the more you govern yourself personally and take ownership of your behavior, And quit blaming other people for your circumstances in life. The very little government control is needed. Proverbs 28 verse 2 says, For the transgression of a land, many are the princes thereof. And by a man of understanding and knowledge, the state thereof shall be prolonged. You want to have a place of peace? Live in a country of peace and, and, and freedom and liberty? Well, the more sin that's allowed to, to, uh, to go rampant in your life and in the lives of others, well, you're just going to get more oppression. You're going to get more police state. You're going to get more uh, uh, surveillance. You're going to get more laws. That's what happens when you don't govern yourself. That's what the Bible says. You know, the, the princes, many are the princes thereof if the, when the transgression increases. They're, why they're, they're, they're there to watch everything. Right, I'm going to skip some of my, my notes here because, uh, but I, I wanted to say that there's a healthy, there's a healthy skepticism of government, and really because we always have to be vigilant. Freedom requires vigilance. That means watchful, because you can lose it easily. And why is that? Because of human nature. Because of human nature. And if you don't understand human nature. Uh, then you'll never really understand what the, is the source of, of how to govern ourselves or even govern uh, as a society. Healthy skepticism of government and rulers is a must for a free society. In Genesis chapter 6, verse, nine, verse 5, it says, uh, the God, uh, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Romans 5.12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered in the world, and death by sin, so that death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. The, see, the Bible teaches you can't really trust man. I talked to a gentleman, a very intelligent young man, uh, a few weeks ago. And he was talking about the hope that we have in the future. And I asked, and he wasn't a Christian, but I asked him, where's your hope coming from? And he talked about how this collective think tank of mankind is sort of bringing about this new consciousness of, uh, of what freedom and peace should be for all people. Oh, it sounded beautiful. It sounded beautiful. But I said, it's a lie. Why? 
Because man is a sinner. And he's and what he and, and sin is not just that you uh, 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 and I can name some other sins, but but see, man is has a propensity to lie. Man has the propensity to cheat. Man has a propensity to, to be aggressive and to hate. And man has a progress uh, a propensity to uh, 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 um, to violence. And so you're gonna put your trust in man? No, you don't put your trust in man. You protect yourself from man. <laughs> you protect yourself from man. Why? Because you know what man is. That's you with me or you or everyone. We're all the same. We're all of the same. See, the Bible teaches that death is passed upon all men. We all die. 100%, you know, 10 out of 10 people die, right? And the Bible says the reason why that is is because of sin in us. We have this sin nature that we inherited from our great, 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 great grandpa, Adam, Ann Rand. Now, some might not be a, a fan of hers, but and she's not really a Christian, but she said this, individual rights are not subject to a public vote. A majority has no right to vote away rights of a minority. The political function of rights is precisely to protect minorities from oppression by majorities. And the smallest minority on the earth is the individual. See, protecting the individual. Now, I know. As a matter of fact, in the West, we sort of uh, uh, do that uh, too much where we uh, look at the individual and put more importance on the individual than, the, than really the whole and sacrifice much on just the, the, the individual. But it's, the individual is very important. And in the east uh, of, our, of our world, uh, the eastern hemisphere, it's usually uh, the expense of the individual for the whole. And therefore, democracy doesn't really work that well. Communism works very well in the east because they think in the group think. They follow the group. Whatever the group says, that's what we do. See, but in the West, because of the Bible, people have stood up and said, and, and stood up for truth and what, was the, what the scripture said, in spite of what the majority said. And they died for it. They were persecuted for it. And Jesus said, it's going to happen. But the thing is, it produced a, a beautiful uh, liberty, even in governments, of, in societies down the road. Now, this isn't heaven. And it's not supposed to be heaven. But we're supposed to be living in peace, as the scripture says. We're supposed to be living in peace. And we pray for those who are in authority that they will exercise wisdom and that God will work in their heart. And listen, that they'll be saved too. True freedom is only found in Jesus Christ. If you want freedom, freedom from what? Oh, from the government. Uh, and from who? The go oh, the government or, or these people who are oppressing me. Well, who's going to give it to you? I'll do it myself. You think so? John 8, 36 says, If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Now, what was Jesus talking about? Listen, the freedom, the freedom from sin. And listen, and the freedom from yourself. See, we are our own worst enemy. When you wake up in the morning, you look at yourself in the mirror, that's your biggest enemy you got. That's the biggest enemy I have. Not other people, not the government. It's myself. I have a sin nature. And I need to be free from that. And if you have Jesus Christ, you'll be free from that. Democracy is not going to make you free from it. Communism, Catholicism, Protestantism, they're not going to make you free from it. Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, that's not going to make you free. B Baptist, Presbyterian, Anglican, that's not going to make you free. What's going to make you free is Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. In John chapter 20, verse 30, 31, it says, But these are written that ye may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. It's in the name of Jesus Christ that you can be liberated and you can have true freedom. You know, the Apostle Paul was in jail many times and he was free. He said, I am bound in these chains. He goes, but the gospel's not bound. He says, I'm bound, but Jesus, he goes, but I'm a, still a free man. See, he looked at himself beyond his circumstances of life. What a way to look at life. You say, oh, he's delusional. 
Well, he was more productive in getting in his purpose in life than I would say you and me together and many people together. And he died a joyful man, a happy man. Now, you can't criticize that. Acts 4.12 4, says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none under the name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus Christ is the only one. He said, I am the way, the truth, and life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. See, when you put the spirit, and I put the spiritual uh, man and the spiritual perspective first, top priority, everything else falls in line. When you reject your, the faith that's necessary to produce what you want to get, then you're really, uh, you're spinning your wheels. You're not getting anywhere. And see, this is what a lot of these governments or protests and, and revolutions uh, were trying to do. They were trying to accomplish something to get peace and, and orderliness uh, and, and let's say even uh, liberty in their lives. But the thing is, they didn't realize you don't get it from uh, um, overthrowing the government. When you overthrow the government and you and you want and you want to take power yourself and the way you think it should be, well, you're just going to get more tyranny, and that's what happened. French Revolution. You could even even say, I mean, I, it's sad when you think about it, but even the Tenement Square uh, massacre. See, the only way you can be truly free is if you have Jesus Christ, and that starts with the individual. Again, it starts with you where you are, with the individual getting right with God. Jesus said it this way as well in Matthew chapter 6. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Not the government of Canada. Not, the over, not democracy in China. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things should be added unto you. That's the promise of Almighty God. He gave us the formula. He gave us the formula for having peace and security and liberty. He says, all these things will be added to you. You don't follow me. You're following fallen man. Galatians chapter 3, verse 10 says, for as, by, uh, for as many as are the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Curses everyone that continueth not the things which are written in the book of the law to do them. There's a curse of, of, of spiritual reality upon mankind, and that curse is that we do not measure up to God's perfection, his law. We don't measure up to the Bible. And the thing is, in Christ, we are, the law is done away in Christ. Oh, why? He just threw it away? No, no, he fulfilled the law. When Jesus died on that cross for your sins and mine, he made it available for our sins to be, for, be paid for. As a matter of fact, when he died, he said these words, it is finished. And that meant he paid in full the requirement of us to be, uh, uh, of us to be righteous before a holy, perfect God. It's, it's like if we were found guilty of a crime and we went to court and we had no way to pay our fine or really we had a sentence we had to serve and it would be uh, something very grieving and oppressive to us. And we said, I don't want to do that. And Jesus Christ fulfilled our requirement to fulfill what the law says to the court, to the holy court of heaven. That's what he's done. He's paid my fine before the holy court of heaven when he died on that cross. The Bible says, with his own blood, the precious blood of Christ, we are bought. And also we're free in freedom, in Christ, free from the guilt of sin. That's what something people are always their life long under a sense of guilt because they have a conscience they know what's right, they know what's wrong, and they know they're guilty be, uh, in their heart, and they feel this guilt, and they never can get rid of it. Oh, they can medicate themselves. They can try to, uh, you know, uh, distract themselves, but a haunting conscience always comes back to them. Why? Because they don't know Jesus Christ. Because they've never really put their trust and faith in him. Because they never understand that they're free from the guilt. Why? Because the, the, the penalty has been paid. We know all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And sin is just a, uh, you know, big sin, little sin, venial, mortal, whatever you want to call it. The Bible says the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. 
The guilt of sin in Romans chapter 8, verse 33, it says, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. And justification means that God looks at you and he says, uh, uh, the, 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 the payment has been paid in full. What are you talking about it for? What are you bringing it up for? What are you thinking about it for? The, it's, it, God has, he says, your sins are as far as from the east as from the west to him. He's, he remembers them no more. Why are you remembering them? Because you're not recognizing what Jesus did for you. We have liberty and freedom from the guilt of sin. We have liberty and freedom from the power of sin. We have, we have free, we're free from the fear of death. Fear of death. The Bible says that there are those who all their lifetime are in subject to bondage because of the fear of death. Yeah, death is not something we look forward to. I mean, that's a natural thing to fear death. But for the Christian who's saved, who's on their way to heaven, we should under, we should always arm our mind and actually and even quell our souls to, to with the understanding that. Our, our sins are forgiven. God is our Father. And leaving this life, separated from this life into the next life, the afterlife, will simply be a graduation into a glorious uh, acceptance by God. That's what heaven is. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, the Bible says. When I leave this body, I'm going to be in heaven instantaneously with Jesus Christ. Now, should I fear that? I should look forward to that. Now, I want to fulfill everything that God wants me down here. And I want to make sure I'm being responsible down here because my life is not my own. But the thing is, I shouldn't fear death. And also, in Jesus Christ, you're free from the fear of man. In Acts chapter 4, interesting, the, the Apostle Peter uh, it says in Acts chapter 4, verse 18, he says, and they called them and, demand, and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than, God, than, than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot speak those, uh, but the, the, we cannot but speak the things which we have, we have seen and heard. <laughs> Listen, when you're saved, when you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you are free from the, 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 uh, the, the snare of fear of the fear of man. And many people, that's the way they operate their life. They fear their employer. They fear their neighbor. They fear, who knows, they fear maybe those in their own household. They live their life in fear of people. We shouldn't be in fear of people, in fear of people. I don't care if they're even mean people to us. We shouldn't fear them. We shouldn't overreact when people uh, treat us unkind, when people say rude things to us. Listen, we just do what Jesus wants us to do and let the chips fall where they may. Not that we don't care about people. No, we love people. But the thing is, they may not be lovable. But didn't Jesus say even love your enemies? That's what makes us different. But the thing is, we don't fear man. <clears throat> it's true freedom. I'm, I'm sorry. It is true freedom to have liberty and uh, and freedom to access, um, we, I should, let me, let me rephrase that. We now have in Christ liberty and freedom to access to our Heavenly Father because we're saved. See, lost people don't have that access. Now, I'm not saying God can't hear your prayer, but you have no right standing before a holy, righteous, perfect God in your own righteousness. Your righteousness, the Bible says it in Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6, as filthy rags. But in, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 20, it says, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, that he that hath consecrated us through the veil that is to say his flesh. When Jesus died on that cross, he was making access to God the Father. In the, old, in, in the Jerusalem at that time, when he, Jesus died, there was the, the, the temple, there was the worship center. 
that God had for the Jews. <clears throat> and there was a compartment in that temple called the Holy of Holies, the most special, holiest spot. And there was a veil or a curtain that covered that. And only the high priest could go in there once a year on the Day of Atonement. And the Bible says when Jesus died on that cross, that veil at the temple was ripped in two. It says from the top to the bottom. And that signified, that signified the access to the holiest uh, 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 audience with God was made possible. How? By the death of Jesus Christ. Have you trusted in Jesus Christ? Listen, liberty and freedom and peace is all wrapped in knowing Jesus Christ. He provides the real kernel of, of peace and life in the spiritual sense that, that transcends into the physical world. And if we don't understand it, and mankind has not, re, has not gotten a hold of that yet, and, then I don't, and I don't believe they will, I don't believe they will, but if you're saved, you should understand where your peace comes from. First, Second Peter chapter uh, two, verse nineteen says, "While they promote liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage." When people promise you liberty and freedom, you need to be skeptical, because liberty and freedom is not found in a form of government. Liberty and freedom is not found in man. Liberty and freedom is found in the supremacy of God and in the Lord Jesus Christ. And there was a day in this land when men knew that. There was a day in this land where our governors knew that. There was a day in this land where our prime ministers understood that. Even Pierre Trudeau signed the Charter of Rights to, to attest to that. Not today. So do you really think we're going to have liberty and freedom? I don't have a lot of hope. I don't have a lot of hope. So oh, that's terrible. You're a pessimist. No, I'm a realist. And I'm all for liberty and freedom, but I just know where it comes from. It comes from knowing Jesus Christ. It comes from the Bible. And that's how mankind has been liberated and been freed. And any other attempts to try to get that liberty and freedom, as oppressive as it is, has always resulted in doom and failure and more oppression. And the Bible does say things are going to get worse before they get better. But listen, Galatians 5.1 says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Christian, you're free. Christian, you live in freedom. And you should, you, if, you're, if you have Christ as your Savior, your sins are forgiven, and you know heaven is your home, you're free. I don't care what kind of government, I don't care what kind of, you're free. You're free in Christ. And don't be led to think you're in bondage.